our Lord and Savior. We have nothing to offer except broken lives, sinful hearts. Yet you accept it so freely, Lord, and you give us the promise of creating within us a new heart and a new spirit. And therefore, Lord, as we come before your awesome throne, we are humbled, Lord, and we know that we are only standing here, we are only sitting here in your house today because of your grace. May you continue to work within us so that we might more fully represent your character and reflect who you are to this dark world. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. So have you ever been very close? You think that you have hit the mark 100%. You know, maybe you wrote an exam. And as you walked out of that exam location, you felt like you have conquered the world. You have <coughs> conquered the world. Only to get your mark back halfway through your uh, midterm break and you see that you failed dismally. Have you ever had that experience? Ah, uh, that's good. <laughs> no, that's not good. <laughs> we have all had similar experiences where we were absolutely sure we got it right. Only to find out we were never even close. Then you have experiences where you were close, but in the bigger scheme of things, you were far. Let me share with you one such experience I had recently. Um, so there was this golf day. I used to play golf. I haven't played golf in a very long time. But when I used to play golf, you get uh, invited to, to play in these charity events you know it's it's either the 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 SPCA that's having a fundraiser or something like that and then a business buys things and then they need to fill that and then they invite you to go and play so for a pastor uh, and on the pastor's salary you always uh, you're excited when you get that invitation because you know you won't normally play in these events uh, but you, you, when, when they invite you, you don't uh, jump up and down, even though you're jumping up and down inside. Uh, you play it calm. No, I'll check my diary. Uh, I'll get back to you. <laughs> so I was invited to one of these days. After the whole golf being experienced, I'm not going to go through what happened there. They had an event afterwards that uh, there was this putting green that had the hole right at the opposite side and it was like a three-tiered sorry i won't move too much it was like a three-tiered um, putting green and you were right at the bottom and now you had one shot to get it up that three hills into the small uh, diameter uh, cup there at the top now it is about 10 centimeters the 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 width or the, the radius of, of uh, this, this cup that you need to put this small ball into. And it was about 40 feet away that you had to stand and now hit it up there. But the, that sounds silly. Until you hear this part, 20,000 rand to the person that gets it into that hole. Have you ever? I've never seen that much money in my life. And... Uh, now you get one chance to hit it into that hole and uh, if you do, you have 20,000 rand to put in your pocket. Now for the one percenters of this world, that means, you know, a little bit uh, more fancy hotel when they go on their, their spending sprees or maybe uh, visit the luxury game reserve over the weekend. But for the other 99% of us, it means maybe getting ahead of the debt that is trying to pull you down. You know, it means maybe a deposit towards a small car for when you finish university. Or even help towards the tuition fees to just make that year. So suddenly everyone became serious about this event. You know, it was fun and laughter and people were joking around until that announcement was made of 20,000 Rand. Then you saw the game faces came on. People went, they 
got their putters, they took their balls and they started practicing. Now it wasn't talking. If you wanted to talk to that person, he says, shh, I'm practicing. This is important. One by one, the people came. Way short. Until it was my turn. Mm. The story is going, stands there. You also look like you know what you're doing. You know, a uh, few practice parts, uh, try a few things. And then I hit this ball. I immediately knew I was in for a shot. This ball just traveled f up the first tier, up the second tier, looking like nothing is going to beat it. Up the third tier, straight towards that hole. And people were starting to get excited. And it stops. <laughs> Seven centimeters was the distance. It stopped from the hole. Straight to the hole, not to the side, not to the left, straight in the middle. All it had to do, seven centimeters. So within the 1,217 centimeters from where I started to hit, to where that cup was, it came up short seven centimeters. But this was not the end of the story. Because as one by one they came, they saw that nobody was even getting close. And they said, okay, it seems like there are only about 20 people left. The person that ends the closest to this hole gets half of the money. Then the spirit was lifted again. Half will also go a long way. You know how many diapers I can buy with that? How many nappies? You know how many bottles will be fed because of that? Now... There was this one man who they dragged from somewhere. He didn't even play golf that day. I don't even think he's ever held a club in his hand. And it was his turn. Now everybody tried going the golfing route, you know, uh, towards this hole. This man just stood there, and I think it was a long day, if you know what I mean. And uh, he just hit this ball. It went up this side of the hill. It ran around some of the spectators, and I'm not joking now. This is true. You had to see it to believe it. It ran past the spectators, and it came trickling down the hill from the other side. Because it, it has like a wall around it. So it went all the way around, and it came up, and it started trickling, running straight for that hole. It hit that hole at the precise angle that it jumped up, and it jumped straight back down into the cup. How is that possible? How is that possible? In the end, it felt like I was robbed. Even though I never had 20,000, never had 10,000, it felt like I was robbed. Have you ever had that experience? You never had something, but when it is gone, you feel like you've been robbed. That was that experience. Now, I felt like should I cry? Should I laugh? Should I be happy for this man? Should I go and shake his hand? Congratulate? How, how do you do these things? And I realized I was close, but I was yet so far. Now, when we go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, keep your Bibles open there for me. Let me see that you bring your swords. Amen. Amen. Let us read Isaiah, chapter 58. 58, verse 1 and 2 again. It says, Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. Now when you look at the prophet Isaiah, he had one of the most uh, exciting lives. Now, when I say exciting, I don't mean one of the easiest lives or one of the most romanticizing, um, whatever, it's life. You know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> one, what is the right word? Romantic li romanticized lives. It was interesting, to say the least. His entire ministry almost lasted 50 years. If you go and do the maths and you look at the kings when he started and kings that he finished, he went through about 50 years from King Uzziah to King Manasseh who ultimately killed him by which means. How did Prophet Isaiah die? By being sawed in half. 
Think about that. By being sawed in half. Of the five kings that he served under, how many do you think feared God? One. So he had four kings that uh, made his life miserable. Because if you are the prophet of God, and you have an evil king, you need to constantly go to that man. God sends you constantly um, with messages. If you had a good king, it was easy. But if you had a bad king, now he had four out of five were bad kings. He thus died a martyr's death and claimed the spot in the great faith chapter of Hebrews 11. Which verse in Hebrews 11 speaks about Isaiah? Verse 37. Let's turn in our Bibles. I bet you never saw this. Hebrews 11 verse 37. Can somebody stand up and read it for us? Hebrews 11 verse 37. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. That sawn asunder means they were sawn in two. Now who died that way? Isaiah. So here is an indirect reference to the prophet Isaiah. Being included in the great faith chapter of Hebrews 11. Now Isaiah balanced judgment. When you read the book of Isaiah, it is beautiful. It balanced judgment and redemption with poetic accuracy. And today many find solace in the guidance that this prophet gave. We find that in the New Testament alone, he is quoted more than 90 times. One of the favorite authors that Jesus quoted was Isaiah. Now the historical context surrounding the writing of this book, it testifies to political upheaval, wars, spiritual digression of God's people to the point that they would sacrifice their own children to idols. However, as mentioned before, Isaiah always preached with the hope of redemption. You will never find Isaiah coming and giving a message. And then when he leaves, the people are without hope. You know, one of the great uh, uh, writers, uh, he said that when you do a sermon, you need to leave the people with hope. A sermon, the pulpit, is a beacon of hope to God's people. Now Isaiah was one of those prophets. He gave stern messages. If you read the book of Isaiah, you will find messages that uh, would make you cringe. But he never ever left God's people without hope. Whether it was advice to a king about political partnerships, or if it was a prophetic message to the children of Judah, it was always laced with hope. Now, let's look specifically at the message that was given in Isaiah chapter 58. We get a picture that all is not well within the land of Judah. We find that the chapter starts with a very strong word. Now, when, when somebody starts with a very strong word, you know that the rest that follows is going to follow suit. Isn't that the case? Uh, as parents, you learn that. You cannot begin to negotiate and then towards the end, you know, you, you turn up the volume a little bit so that the child knows. If you want the immediate reaction, you need to start with the volume turned up. I don't mean shouting. I just mean having a stern uh, voice when you speak. Children are the cleverest thing that you will find. I think the parents, can, they know how to, man they master manipulators. Um, Olivia has now gotten to the age where if mommy says no, daddy. And if daddy says no, mommy. You know, and we, we need to just be on our toes the whole time that we don't speak one this language and the other one another language because then she exploits it like a master politician. I tell you. Now, when we get to this, we find that it starts with a very strong word. It is written in Hebrew in such a way that the verb instructs the prophet to shout. At the top of his voice. 
You know, it actually denotes clearing your lungs of all the oxygen within it. To the point that your throat actually gets rough. God tells Isaiah that this message should not be mis mistaken for a weekly newsletter. You know, the prophet comes around, he gives the news, and goes away. This is not one of those messages. It should not be mistaken because this is a matter of life and death. No, this message should be so loud and clear that nobody would be able to say, but, but we did not know, Lord, that it was so important. When Levi was born, we had to stay in hospital for two nights. And the one evening we were sleeping, and there was a, a sound that woke us up. That when I, when I woke up, it felt like I was, uh, I was, I had like chicken, no, not chicken pox, what's it? <laughs> That's Afrikaans, who knows place? Uh, goosebumps. I had like goosebumps. <laughs> chicken pox, something else. Eh? <laughs> I had goosebumps. It, it, it felt like somebody was pushing a dagger into your, your heart. Somebody was shouting. I thought somebody was being murdered. And uh, then when the nurse came in, I said, do we need to hide? Is there, you know, a attack on the hospital? What is happening? And the nurse says, no, it's normal. It's a woman giving birth. <laughs> but I've never heard a shout like that before. There's my little, um, what, what do you call this, this talk of... Uh, where you talked with the young people that they don't uh, fall pregnant. You know, that talk, that was it. Okay? <laughs> that shouting needs to scare anybody of thinking, no, I'm joking. It's the most beautiful thing to, to witness a child being born. Now, the point that I'm trying to make is I knew something was, something was going on. And this is the same with the prophet Isaiah. When God speaks to Isaiah and he says, shout at the top of your voice, clear all oxygen from your lungs to the point that your throat gets sore. It's because it's an important message. God then tells Isaiah to tell his people that they are in rebellion against him. That sounds like a normal message, doesn't it? The point is that the people of Israel thought that they were in harmony with God, as we will see from the chapter. You see, verse 2 indicates where the children of Israel were actually in their spiritual walk. They had a form of godliness, yet lacked a personal relationship with God. It says there that uh, they, 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 yet they seek me day by day and delight to know my ways. Now when you look at that word delight that is used here, it actually has an outward appearance is the word that's being used. So they had a delight in serving God only in outward appearance. A form of godliness, but lacking a personal relationship with God. You know what the scary part of this whole chapter was, or is? Is that this pronunciation comes as a surprise to the nation of Israel. It seems as if the children of Israel were at a stage where they wanted to be righteous in their own ways. They declared that they were keeping the ordinances of God to the letter, actually. They were even as bold, listen to this, they were even as bold as to say that their righteousness as a nation is commendable. They said to God, God, commend our righteousness. For we are walking in your ways like none of our forefathers have ever done. And it's actually during this time that you see the rise of Phariseeism. It was with good intent. You think the Pharisees just wake, woke up one day and said, we are going to rebel against God. It all started with good intentions. They saw that their forefathers have been taken away into captivity because of the nature of their relationship with God. And they said, but God gave us laws. Let's live as strict as possible to them so that we will never ever be led astray again. 
They were so certain of this that they demanded from God that he pass down just decisions when dealing with them. Not knowing that it would mean their destruction. You see, friends, they were deceived by their own form of godliness. For they were oh so close, but yet so far. The last portion of verse 2 tells us that they felt near to God. It actually says that they felt near to God. They were basking in His presence, or so they thought. But truth be told, God could not pour out these blessings upon them, for in their hearts they were still busy with ungodly things. Verse 2 tells us that God knows the heart, for He tells them that you, O children of Israel, seem to seek my ways. Yet you are rebelling against me. Have you ever thought how this is possible? It seems, yet you are so far. How can it be that in doing all the things we think are good and just, we are in actual fact rebelling against God? How can it be that we are oh so close? We think we feel the presence of God as the nation of Israel did, and yet be so far. Actually, it says doing the work of iniquity. Let me tell you that it is easy to fall into this trap. God uses the example of fasting to illustrate the point that he's making with the nation of Israel. To show them how far they are actually removed from his presence. Let us read verse 3 to 5 of Isaiah chapter 58. It says, Why have you fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. That is home, doesn't it? These seem to be honest questions. They start off by saying, Lord... Have you not seen that we have fasted? Have you not seen how we have humbled ourselves before you and have lifted up ourselves to you? However, God says that your religion is one of outward appearance only, while in your heart corruption runs rife. On the same day that you fast, you hit your workers. Now, now, Today, that's, that's, uh, you will get into trouble with camera phones. We have seen that, okay? And uh, CCTV cameras and all these things. So, how do we make that practical? The people that you are to look after, the same day that you fast, you treat them badly. That's what God is actually saying here. With the same hand you use to throw the ashes on your head that you fast, you strike those who you perceive to be your lesser. The voice you use to shout the praises to God and to ask for blessings is the one you use to lash your household. God then says to them, Is this what you think I want? Do you think that the outward ordinances is what I find pleasure in? Now let me pause here for a moment and make this practical for us. God used the example of fasting to bring across a message. But let us use church attendance and apply the message to us today. And we have been sleeping. Now is the time to wake up, okay? Because <laughs> we're, we're going to eat home now. It becomes evident that when we sit in these pews, and when we sing the hymns that we have sung, and when we stand up to preach, we might feel in the presence of God. Not right? 
when that's singing, when, when that, that soprano and that tenor and that bass, and they all harmonize so well together, and that hymn just comes over in a way that uh, only the closer people can sing. Uh, <laughs> you feel in the presence of God. I ride with the Ucristo uh, Ingomene in my car. I can show you. It's uh, as if the language was written to be sung in. Uh, I say that everything. Or developed to sing in. Now, when we do that, we feel in the presence of God. Amen? It might look to others sitting in the church that for all intent and purposes... Sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so have been blessed with the gift of preaching this morning. Brother so-and-so was moved by the Spirit in the way he delivered a special item today. Yet all the while we are deceiving ourselves. We see God telling Israel that while they were busy with the holy things, their minds and actions testify to being busy with unholy things. I imagine it as such. What if while we are busy singing the hymn, instead of the words that you are reading on the screen, the thoughts running through your head is voiced? How different would our singing be? Instead of when we are kneeling down to pray, instead of saying Amen, what comes out of our voice is what's going through our heads. How different would our prayers be? Therefore, when the children of Israel said, But Lord, we prayed and confessed on the hilltop so that all may hear how sorry I am. God will say, But I heard what your heart was shouting, loud and clear, and it was rebelling against me. Therefore, I could not answer. Did you get that? While you were busy singing praises with your voice, I was listening to your heart, and that I could not answer. Now let me share with you something about this rebellion. As I was studying this, I came to realize that God's presence were amongst them all along. Yet they, they missed the simplicity of being in God's presence. They wanted to claim righteousness for themselves and they were seeking this righteousness for themselves. Now Satan's deceptions are cunning, friends. When you read um, Ephesians 6 verse 10, it actually tells us that it is the schemes of the devil. He does not attack us head on. And I used the example this morning at Pathfinders. When you are in the playground and uh, the bully comes up to you and he stands in your face and he says this afternoon, Behind the feet soccer, behind this, the, 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 the bicycle, black place, <laughs> the two of us, we are going to sort this out. Satan does not work like that. He puts a trip wire there when you're going to fetch your bicycle. And as you get out, you fall. He's hiding behind the bush with a stick and he just hits you and he runs away. And you have no time to do anything because you... That's the schemes of the devil. That's how cunning he is. To the point that when we look at the presence of God, we say, but it cannot be that simple. Yet Jesus kept on preaching it, kept on illustrating it to the people, that your neighbor, what you do to them, you have done to me. Could it be that simple? That as we minister to the needs of those around us, we are in the presence of God? Matthew chapter 25 verse 3 to 46 tells us this. That when the king appears on the clouds, he will separate the goat from the sheep. And then they would say, but why is this separation taking place? Uh, are you a separatist? Uh, God will say no. God will say no. When I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was naked, you gave me something to wear. When I was sick, you came to visit me. When I was in prison, you were there for me. 
And they will say, but Lord, when did we do these things? And how will God answer? I say to you, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. You love me unconditionally. Sometimes we ask, why is that guy in prison? Now, what did he do to deserve that? Why is this guy naked? Why is this guy poor? Why is this? God says, love me unconditionally. I am the one who works with the why. I have given you so that you can give. It is not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house. When you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Isaiah 58 verse 7. When they said this outward appearance, how do we need to serve the Lord then? He says, is it not this? To divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house. When you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. When we read, and we do not have time to read everything, God says to Israel, your righteousness can never be attained through the selfish desires of your sinful hearts. It will be impossible. It will only lead to a life of faithful church attendance that knows all the hymns by heart, gives diligently their tithes and return, return diligently the tithes and give faithfully the offerings, but lack God's character. Love. God says that when you learn to trust me and you surrender yourself to me, I will do the following in your life. And I would like you to open your Bibles as we close. At Isaiah chapter 58, verse 8 to 12. If it is not yet underlined in your Bible, you have to. Then your light will break. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 8 to 12. Listen to this. Then your light will break out like the dawn. And your recovery, recovery will be speedily spring forth. And your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You see the change now, the hope. That he's bringing. In the beginning, they were calling out, they were praying, but God says, I cannot answer while there's rebellion in your heart. Then he gives them what it is to serve God. And then he says, Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and the speaking wickedness, gossiping, and if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the, desire, satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday and the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places. Now listen to this. And give strength to your bones and you will be like a well-watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail, those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins, and you will rise up the age-old foundations, and you will be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. Amen. What a beautiful promise. God is waiting to bestow that upon His people once they get rid of this this. this this pride, it cannot be summed up otherwise. It is pride when we want to draw people to look to us. To see what we have accomplished. Now notice how verse 8 says, And your righteousness will go out before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. When we serve the Lord faithfully and we do it in the way that He has asked us to do it, you do not have to stand on the hilltop and proclaim that you are a child of God. For the people working in your household, the people that you spend the day with at home, oh, at home, at work, 
they will see the Lord walking behind you, shining His light through you. I invite all of you to come to this God. He wants to be part of your life. Psalm 34 verse 8 says that we should taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in Him. When I hit the putt and it stopped 10 centimeters from that 20,000 rand, it was oh so close, yet so far. I was Israel that night, like Israel that night to my wife, telling her of my excellent putt. Yet when she passed judgment and asked, but did you win? Where's the money? I stood with empty hands. And all I could say was, oh so close, yet so far. We might be standing at judgment one day. And hoping that our 10 centimeter short effort was enough to inherit eternal life. But friends, let's be honest today. You will be standing with nothing but a rebellious heart. A heart that is not wholly surrendered to God is a rebellious heart. I want to plead with you today as Isaiah pleaded and say that we cannot play around anymore. For when we are shaken, as earth's time is running out, Either the rebellion will grow or we will surrender to God wholeheartedly. He is faithful and true. He is merciful and just. He is love and wants to impart His righteousness to you to stay. So that you will not be left short come judgment day. Amen.